Hello and welcome to our podcast, 10 Lessons It Took Me 50 Years to Learn, where we talk to business people, journalists, ambassadors, artists, sports heroes, leaders and luminaries from all over the world. In other words, we'll be talking to interesting people about their interesting experiences. My name is Siebe van der Zee and I'm your host. I'm originally from the Netherlands, happily residing in the beautiful Grand Canyon state of Arizona in the United States, also known as the Dutchman in the desert. I hope you will enjoy this program. The podcast is sponsored by PDF, the Professional Development Forum. You can find and learn more about PDF at professionaldevelopmentforum.org. Our guest today is Marianne Miller. Marianne serves as the Chief Administrative Officer at Phoenix-based Avnet Corporation. Avnet is a global electronic components distributor, and it is the largest company in the state of Arizona with more than 15,000 employees working on three continents and with close to $20 billion in revenues. The company has been in existence for 100 years. It was founded in 1921. Marianne offers deep expertise in business transformation, human resources, and operations. For more than 10 years as a corporate officer, she has been playing a key role with Avnet's board of directors on matters of CEO succession, board succession, and governance. Marianne's earlier career includes executive leadership positions at Goodrich Corporation, Orthologic, and Allstate Insurance. You can find her detailed bio on our website, 10lessonslearned.com. Welcome, Marianne. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. It's great that you are part of this podcast and we're going to listen to your 10 lessons. I'm looking forward to that. Also, we have known each other for quite some time. And I must say, I'm very impressed uh, how you have advanced in your career over the years, dealing with senior level issues in the companies that you've worked for. Quite a career. And with that, I'm curious, I think I know, but I'm curious, uh, are we now at a stage where it is common and generally accepted that women have unlimited access to senior level positions in major companies, including at the board level, or do you still see challenges? Well, I, I think the key word in what you said is unlimited and no, it's not, it's not unlimited. There are barriers that still exist. However, I do think companies have a sincere desire to advance women and it's proven um, by the women that have achieved high level positions and that uh, the progress that's been made in getting women on boards today, but there are just still some inherent barriers that we need to work on. So, you know, for example, I think it's really two things that limit, particularly at the board level from women getting ahead. The first being that the criteria for board roles are such that there are very few women in that pool that possess those criteria. And so a lot of times in the board, the board succession process, boards are looking for CEOs, CFOs, and people with P and L experience. And you're going to get a more limited pool looking at those roles. So I think the answer on that particular thing is to just be more open-minded about what other backgrounds bring to the board. And that would allow more women in, allow more women to have ready access. Now, the other thing is people are more comfortable with their kind. You know, if you um, have ever looked into the topic of unconscious bias, people are just more comfortable interacting with people of the same type and the same kind. And this is another thing that limits the opportunities for women in the workplace. But overall, Siva, I think that companies are dedicated to making changes here. And I think we're going to see a lot faster movement in the future. There's a lot in what you're saying there. And we see in a few states in the United States that by law, it is required to have a woman serve on the board, for example. It, it doesn't really impress at the same time. It's better than it doesn't have to be that way. The other point that I think you made that I think is so important is the awareness of understanding that there are differences between men and women, right? And it is something that companies have to understand and be aware of to allow, quote unquote, women to do their thing without expecting things to be the same or similar to the way men would do things. 
it's okay to allow that, but yes, it goes with a lot of awareness and, and. Right. Yeah. And I think, you know, from a, a C-suite level, there's more transparency around the positions and the skills required. So you will get the call from the headhunter and have a chance to apply for jobs, or you, you will know about roles more easily. But from a board perspective, those positions are not posted anywhere. Yeah. And so it would be difficult for you to apply for a position and share your skills with a, a governance committee without having a recruiter or without having a board member sponsor you for that type of thing. So I think we need to create more transparency around the board roles as well. And I think also, can I say more women like yourself who have been successful and have gone through the obstacles and have learned those lessons. So. I think that's very valuable. I'm, I'm curious also, Marianne, before we get into your 10 lessons, is there a lesson that you have learned in life or in business, in your career that you would like to teach yourself if you would be 30 years old today? Uh, oh, absolutely. There's many lessons, but I think the first one would be to respond versus react. So my 30 year old self, I was very, uh, very ambitious, very dedicated, hardworking perfectionist. And I took my work very seriously. And so it was very hard for me to take criticism at that point in time, not to take things personally. And even, you know, I go back and think of me at 44 years old in my uh, MBA program. And I remember getting into a debate with my teacher because he said that my, my paper that I wrote sounded textbook ish. And I just couldn't believe that he would call my work textbook ish. So, um, you know, upon reflecting, I do realize that there was good feedback given to me along the way and that I wish I would have known and listened to that sooner and also behaved in a more professional manner when I received the feedback, been more thankful, been more open. And uh, today I will say when I do receive feedback, I take it to heart. Well, lessons learned. Uh, I appreciate that. And obviously it's a bit of a tough question to say, Hey, what have you learned and would teach yourself when you're 30 years old, but you're, you're very gracious with that. <laughs> <laughs> well, sure. I look back sometimes and I go, Oh, how did I do that? You know? And it was all again, good intentioned, but you just don't know. You don't realize you don't see yourself sometimes. I know. And I'm, <laughs> I'm in it myself. I agree. I agree. Well, let's take a look at the, the 10 lessons. The, the first one. I like it a lot. Integrity, period. What do you mean with that? I think I know. What I mean is there is nothing else. That's the end. You have to have integrity. It's something that can't ever be compromised because being true to your word is what builds trust and trust enables you to move forward as a person, as a leader. You, you simply cannot be effective if you're not trusted. And this is something that I learned from an early age. I had very strong family influences. I grew up in uh, an Italian family. My father was an immigrant. We were very close. We worked very hard and had a high sense of ethics. And I remember a couple of my first lessons around integrity. Well, one was um, I forged a note from my parents to get out of going to recess because I preferred to stay in during <laughs> recess time and read. So, um, I thought it would be a good idea to write a note to my teachers to say that, you know, on behalf of my parents, well, did I get in big trouble for that one? And that was, you know, at six years old. So I learned that lesson very early. I think, um, the other lesson was watching my father because he, he grew up an Italian immigrant. He came to the country when he was 17 years old. And at that time, you know, America was the land of freedom and the land of opportunity. And there were people in his cohort that took advantage of the system at that point in time. And I'll, I'll remember he was, a, my dad was a bricklayer. He's still alive today and doing great. Good. And he had friends that would go out on disability and collect disability and they would while they were collecting disability, go do side jobs and collect money in cash because they thought, you know, this is America. That's the land of opportunity. And my father always knew this was wrong and, you know, he would never consider doing such a thing. So watching him, knowing how the system worked and knowing what the right thing to do was, was a very big influence for me as I was growing up. I think Many things are black and white, so it's easy to make the right decision, but there's also a lot of gray 
And that's where you have to weigh competing interests. And I remember in my MBA program at ASU, one of the classes I took around uh, ethics and morality is that every time you look at a situation, you should look at it from a legal standpoint, a managerial standpoint, and then also what's the right thing to do. And if you evaluate things based on those three lenses, you come up with a pretty good answer. There's a lot to it uh, in what you're saying. I, I do like the lesson integrity period. There is no way about it. It is integrity or it's not integrity. Exactly. And you're going to run into it at different points. Like I think back, one of the career moments that struck me was I was working for a gentleman that hired me back into the workforce after I had been out on maternity leave. Great guy. Um, and I heard from the corporate office that they were going to be terminating his employment and I needed to be involved in the whole termination process. And it was very carefully staged. And the day before this was all due to happen, the individual came into my office and said he'd been getting a bad feeling. He'd been talking with some people at corporate. They're sort of, um, avoiding him. And he point blank asked me if he was going to be fired. And so in that instant, I had to make a decision whether I was going to be truthful with him because I had known him and the guy's looking me in the eye and I, and I cannot tell a lie or whether I was going to take a corporate position and follow through with the plan that had already been in motion. And it, it was just quick because that's yeah. how you have to act sometime. And I just said to him, yes, I told him, yes, I told him that was not the intention for us to have him learn about it in this way. And, um, he was very grateful and I was a little worried because I thought, wow, is, is yeah. corporate going to have an issue with this now? Because I've, you I've took a risk, usurped the plan. I took a risk at the time and, um, they were fine with it. They were fine. Uh, we just readjusted the plan. He was grateful that I was honest with him. I felt better about myself, even though it was a terrible circumstance and something you never like to be involved in, but having an HR career, I was involved in a lot, but that really stuck with me. And I, and I committed from that point on that I would always just be truthful. Well, let um, me but, ask, let yeah. me ask a question because what if your company would have faulted you for disclosing that information? I'd have to live with the consequences and feel like, okay, well. I did what I thought was the right thing and paid they the price. Read. Yeah, I paid the price. And many times that does happen when you think about, you know, take it even up a notch. That was a, you know, a mid career story. Now, you know, in the past few years, I'd been dealing at the board level and the stakes are much higher yep. or, you know, you're involved in, in things like uh, CEO performance evaluation, where you have to give feedback on your boss. Um, and you have to ride a fine line between serving the board of directors and the shareholders of the company, as well as serving the management team. So it's a very fine line and important thing is to just state your truth. I've always told my husband, I can get fired at any minute. <laughs> so just know this. And, um, you know, fortunately, by the time you reach that level, you need to have the confidence to be able to speak your truth, um, regardless of whether there are consequences. That's why I like integrity, period. That's, that's the lesson. Lesson number two, say yes to new opportunities. I'm, I'm curious about that one, but please go ahead. So I think many of us are fearful sometimes of things, the unknown things that weren't part of our plan. Uh, we might be uneasy. We might be too busy to take on something and we might want to say no. I have to admit that I initially wanted to say no to this podcast <laughs> because simply for some of those reasons, too busy. Oh, I don't know if my stories are going to be interesting enough for everybody out there. Um, but you know, following my own advice, I said, yes, you never know where an opportunity might lead. And I've experienced this many times during my career. The earliest being I was, my husband and I worked for the same company. We had a policy that I couldn't be in HR and have a relative in the company. So one of us had to move somewhere else and they offered me a job in the department that I thought was the worst department in the entire company. Cause I had been their HR rep and they had all sorts of problems. And when they asked me, where did I want to go? I said, anywhere, but that, 
And of course they put me there instead. <laughs> so it was such a learning experience for me. I, you know, I went in I, with, you know, wide eyes. I learned because I didn't know anything about the function. I didn't know the people, but I got in there, I dug in and it turned out to be one of the best experiences of my life because I didn't know I could be more open to the ideas of the people in the department. And I stimulated really a group to be very motivated to achieve their productivity numbers after we had just implemented a new uh, claim paying system. So it was just a phenomenal experience. And the manager that I worked for wrote me a letter at the time after I left and said that he'd never seen anything like it, that somebody not knowing the area at all, not having subject matter expertise can come in learn and have a positive impact that way. I think it's a great point for so many people. And, you know, we're dealing with, let's say the economy upside down, uh, employment situations worldwide are different than what they were a few years ago to keep an open mind and perhaps at some point to pursue things that were not number one on your list. And in your case, and that could happen to anyone, it turned out to be a great experience. Right. And it's happened to me multiple times. Another example, again, in the interview process is that I had someone offer me a job and it just simply was not the caliber of a move that I wanted to make. It was just not in my bailiwick. And initially I wasn't even going to interview for it, but it was a friend that referred me and I said, okay, I will go through this process, but you know, this is never going to work. Well, what ended up happening was I declined the job, but the person, the recruiter knew of me, liked me and knew of another job that yep. was coming available, called me and I got a job out of that opportunity. So you just never know who you're going to run into. So if you say yes, more often you, there's more often a time where you might have an unexpected pleasure out of it. I like it. I like it. And I can relate again. I I've, I've lived in, in four countries on three continents and I never expected that, but here I am. So. Good lesson. Lesson number three, your reality can be your dream. Very intriguing because you're not saying your dream can become your reality. No, exactly. your reality can be your dream. Right. And you know, well, most graduates are told, follow your dreams, follow your dreams, but sometimes you don't have dreams. I had a dream of being a singer when I was young, I would do all the show tunes at dinner and, um, of course, my parents didn't think that was a wise path to choose. It wasn't very steady and, you know, it wasn't very likely that I would be one of the famous ones. So I pursued a more conservative path, but I think, you know, everyone feels some sort of pressure to have some career goals. And for myself, I, I had a degree in liberal arts. I wasn't quite sure what to do. And initially I thought maybe I would go into international law. And then I thought, no, I want to take a break from school and just go right into a business opportunity. And fortunately I landed a job as a um, management trainee with Allstate insurance company, and they were terrific. But my point with this lesson is that you can take whatever it is, whatever your current role is and make it into a dream. Like I think back on my career and, and what I've accomplished, never setting out to accomplish those things, but because I delivered on the basics. I always tried to raise the bar and innovate on things that I do. I establish credibility and trust with people because of the actions that I took. That's why I was rewarded with the roles that I was rewarded with. And it is a dream. You know, I, I think back, I never imagined that I would have achieved the type of role that I have today, that I would have interacted with the people that I have today. I know people all over the world. I've traveled all over the world and it was never a dream, but you know, it is, it's a wonderful experience and I feel very, very grateful for that. And, and Marianne, what a great lesson for our listeners, up and coming professionals at any age, as we call it, this is the kind of story that I think will inspire people. Uh, very Absolutely. You have the opportunity to stand out no matter what it is that you're doing. Lesson number four, have a system, your own system or whatever type of system, but have a system. What do you exactly. think of that? <laughs> so we all have to juggle many, many things and prioritize and 
it's important that we be reliable. There are people that count on us, whether we're, you know, a leader in a work environment or whether we're a parent or a caregiver of any kind, or even just taking care of ourselves, you have trade-offs and things to manage. So everyone manages it in a different way. And so one of the career lessons around this was one of my early bosses, he used to, every time he handed out an assignment, he would write it on a triplicate form and he would give you the assignment in writing. And then the day it would, was due, you would find another copy of it in your inbox <laughs> just to make sure you were having it due. And if, if you didn't get it done, then you got the, you know, the pink slip at the end that again said, you know, kind of final warning, this is due right now. So that was a little bit extreme and it also dates me with the carbon paper story, but, <laughs> but, um, it, it was a big lesson because this guy never let anything fall through the cracks. So always I tried to pick up tips along the way that would allow me to juggle everything. And, you know, being a, a woman with a professional career and a family that, that was a big feat sure. to do. So there were a few things. There was one technique I learned early on, it was the Swiss cheese technique, where you take a big project and you learn how to break it up into little pieces, like the holes in the Swiss yeah. cheese, so you can actually get things done that way. The other um, technique was having a waiting bag with me. So I would always carry a bag of reading material or things that I needed to do no matter when I was going to an appointment so that if I had to wait for a half an hour for a doctor to show up or something, I was always keeping busy and never, yeah. you know, worried about <laughs> filling the time. I tried the Franklin planner system. That was a bust for me, but you have to have something. So m my method was lists, spreadsheets. I had chore lists for the kids. I had grocery lists. I had, uh, you know, project management lists for my work environment. Very important that you're able to give your stakeholders what they need and you have to employ whatever style works for you. I think that's the point, right? Have a system that works for you. And yeah. there could be multiple systems that are available, but the one that works for you as an individual, I, I do the same. And, and I know many people that have a system. I think it's a very good lesson. You know, and I think one final piece to that is in, in a work environment, knowing what works for your constituents. Like as an example, during my time at Avnet, I had four different compensation committee chairs and they all wanted to manage the compensation committee a little bit different. So my style adapted to what type of output they were seeking. Some were, were very hands-on, wanted to be involved. Some were, you know, completely hands-off. And so when you're operating, particularly at a high level, it's important to ask your constituents what works for them. Yeah, makes sense. I like it. I like it. The next lesson, lesson number five, I almost want to say it's more academic, uh, but perhaps not. Use a panoramic lens. You want to see the big picture. How do you do that? So it's not always easy because we can get blinded by what's in front of us. You know, we're all busy yeah. hamsters on a wheel running and we have a stake in certain things. So we get very attached to what our, you know, way of doing things is. But I found it much more effective if you can just kind of step back from all the noise and really look at what's going on, who's saying what trying to summarize all of the points. And I, I worked for uh, a CEO who was magnificent at this. He, he could listen to all this noise, rise above the chatter, and then he would summarize exactly what happened and what we were going to do, like putting a bow on it, you know, easily. So um, it was something that I worked hard to learn over the years, this stepping back. And one of the opportunities for me to do that was when I was in my uh, master's class where they teach the Socratic method and the mm -hmm. professor is out there throwing out questions and everyone's eagerly trying to answer, come up with the answers. And because I had this sort of methodical way where I would take in all the inputs, I was very successful at that. And one of my partners in the program said, boy, you know, I just watch you and everyone's out there running around and you just sit there yeah. and then you sink the three point shot. And I thought that was pretty cool because I'm not athletic at all. I'm <laughs> to sink the three point shot in a in an academic environment, that was pretty good. I, yeah, I would say so. Good, so. <laughs> I like that. I like that a lot. If you if you think about that at the board level, that's of course very significant as well to 
have that big picture approach, how you can help individual organizations. Yeah, that's, uh, you're absolutely right there. And in the boardroom, sometimes what happens is you get a few voices that are louder than the rest. Yep. And sometimes you'll, you know, you'll, you'll get a frenzy going in a certain direction and overlook some of the uh, voices with very thoughtful input along the way on those same topics. So it's important whether you're a board chair or chair of any of the committees to be able to to take all of those inputs and synthesize them into what makes sense. If I think of the, the COVID uh, issue worldwide, nothing of that seems to have been anticipated by yeah. organizations. And yes, it's hitting harder than anybody expected, but sometimes that's part of the process to expect things that are unlikely, but what would you do if they happen? And, and companies do that in other areas. But on the human side, the impact on employees and, and of course, supply chains and everything connected to that, that big picture, I think is uh, extremely important sometimes to anticipate things that. Well, you know, and that's an interesting right. point too, because um, in the past we prepared for the blue, the bird flu and the swine flu and all of those, yeah. but COVID nobody prepared for, it just came and companies had to react. And I have to say, I think companies have done a marvelous job. Avnet uh, really stepped up in this situation, but as have many companies switching over to remote work and making sure that customers were taken care of during a time like this. We're talking today with Marianne Miller, a successful global human resources expert and board advisor, sharing her 10 lessons learned. We're up to lesson number six, embrace learning. Boy, 10 lessons learned, it fits together and great yeah. learning. Uh, what are your thoughts about that? Well, learning is all around. And it, this one reminds me of um, a talk that I had given that was called Our Leaders Born or Made because some people are natural leaders. And I have to admit, there is some natural leadership tendencies in me. You know, as a child, I would start neighborhood clubs and things like that. Just always sort of had that bent to take up. I wouldn't be surprised. Thing. I'm and surprised. my, uh, my kids always made fun of me for it, but they know, they, they know that it's true because they see how I am today. But anyway, there's opportunities to learn all around us. And while people may have some innate leadership ability, anyone can learn to be a leader or lead themselves. I mean, we learn from other people. We learn from managers we've worked for good and bad. We learn from experiences we've had and some of the toughest ones produce some of the best results. You know, while you're going through it, you don't realize that this is significant to you, but you know, afterwards, yeah. um, really helpful. So one of the things that I think is important is to read, keep yourself informed on what's going on. And I know there's news all around us, so it's kind of hard, again, a lot of noise, but limit yourself at least to some good sources. I read Harvard Business Review and Wall Street Journal and those types of things, but there's a magazine called The Week. And what it does is just summarize tidbits from everything that happened during the week. And it summarizes global issues, pop culture issues, local issues, whatever it may be. And I found that a very helpful way to kind of quiet the other noise and keep focused on, you know, just ensure that I always had a high level view of these things. And so um, I think the most important thing is to remain open to learning. And as I've discovered from many of the experience I had where I went in and I was not the expert in that area, just even as chief administrative officer, I took on some departments that I had never run before. Allow yourself to be open, allow yourself to say you don't know, rely on the people around you, show a bit of vulnerability as a leader because you go into those situations and you bring a lot of experience but there's also a lot that you can learn yourself. So this is an ongoing thing and, um, you know, a big commitment. It, it takes time, right? When you talk about reading or learning in general. So is this something that you weave into your system? Absolutely. I do. So, you know, I still carry around that waiting bag. I told you about yeah. the, whenever I, you know, I'll bring my week magazine with me when I go to the hair salon or whatever yeah. it may be, so I can take the time and catch up and do that kind of thing. But you, it's really important to weave it in, not always easy um, That's it. to weave in the formal learning, Real but busy. you yeah. know, take into account the learning that's happening all the time. Yeah, no, I like it, but it is tough when you have a lot on your plates and, and then 
perhaps in some cases it feels like, well, reading, okay, I can postpone that, which mm -hmm. technically you could, but if you don't read, you don't learn, etc., then that will impact you at some point as well. So I like it. Lesson number seven, your toughest competition is you. Well, I have to say, as you know, I'm into performance coaching. I can relate to that, but what are your thoughts? So why this one stands out for me is that having had a career in HR and coaching people myself, there's a lot of people that are always looking above the cubicles to see what everybody else is doing and what they're getting and are, have they advanced quicker than I have or whatever. It doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. What matters is the fact that you continue to improve and you continue to achieve your personal best. And so, um, I think the one big thing is the learning from mistakes because, you know, in my early career, I used to beat myself up a lot over mistakes. I still do a little bit, but more light handed, <laughs> but, um, I don't ever make the same mistake twice. So you need to start to recognize what are those things, what causes you to make those types of mistakes and learn how to not make them. I had a couple of colleagues that got fired from every job they ever had because they kept making the same, same mistakes. And one, I took a chance on, I recruited him into our company and said, Hey, don't do this. When you come here, <laughs> I was very blunt about it. There was no, you know, no mincing words. And he still did the same thing over again. And he got the same result and got fired. So, you know, the lesson here is continue to improve yourself. You know, there may be skills you're never going to be great at, but at least minimize your liabilities. Is it something that you see, you know, if I think of diversity, uh, is it something you see more or less when it comes to women in business or, uh, any other category that you say, you know, some people based on their cultural background, they may be more hesitant, uh, to, to adjust. No, I, I mean, this is one that's pretty universal. I've seen it in all, all types. It's, it's by the individual. Okay. No, a fair point. I, I was just thinking in terms of you know, people that are holding back, they may, they may have certain issues by, well, you know, they're not necessarily ready to make changes and adjustments. One, I don't know that they buy into the feedback in the first place. So that mm -hmm. might be part of it. And the other is they lack self-awareness and um, yeah. lacking self-awareness is a killer at the executive yeah. level. You can't, you know, really sit back and kind of look at yourself from a outside perspective. That's very difficult yeah. for you to forward in an executive role. Yeah. Makes sense. Lesson number eight. Lead from the center, balance composure. Boy, it, 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 it really fits the other lessons that you have uh, shared with us. Yeah, absolutely. And these are my own that I learned over the years, but also in roles where I observed other people and had the chance to coach other people. And, um, you know, with this, as soon as you take on the role to become a leader, you are now responsible for other people. So it's not all about you anymore. Yep. It's about a broader team. And so you need to be the calm in the storm, the steady hand through difficult times. I always think of that Italian cruise ship captain <laughs> that got himself off the ship and left all the passengers yeah, I remember. there, you know, this is not, this is not the kind of thing you do as a leader. So I knew I have examples from throughout my career that helped me form my own, um, embodiment of composure is I had a guy early on, you know, his hair was always on fire. We'd always run around <laughs> with hair on fire and you couldn't trust him. You didn't know, you know, what was going to happen. Does he have your back or things going to. Mm. Uh, you know, go south. And I've seen this one actually happen a little more with women. And it's, it's extra bad for women because we get labeled with the stereotype yep. of being emotional anyway, Stands emotional, can't yep. handle it. And so this is the last thing we want to do is, you know, walk around being busy, busy, busy and emotional because there's too much going on. It's very important to have, you know, this more, uh, more of a smooth and, you know, sometimes we're not always so confident about everything. Like I think of times, I think of the duck with the, the feet underwater, you know, they look calm on the surface, but they're paddling and paddling. <laughs> That's okay. I mean, you might be paddling, you might be a little nervous underneath, but you've got to display that composure. And to me also at a leadership level, 
composure equals command skills because a leader can't be commanding if people view them as, you know, kind of flighty, flaky, not reliable. I, I think it's an issue that worldwide is so relevant. It, it seems like, well, I'm not just making this up, of course, the world is so divided and not just in politics, but people have opinions, strong opinions, and you have to find somewhere, you know, it's sort of a Dutch expression. You have to be able to get to the door together. It's not just one person and then the other one is stuck. And leading from the center, I think is, a, is an interesting uh, concept because it is truly uh, something that I think we can use all over the world. Let's come together. Let's, let's figure things out together. And we don't all have to agree, but we do have to figure it out together in order to move forward. All right, let's move on to lesson number nine, show them who you really are. And I can see that there could be some risks involved if you really show them who people are. No, and I, I think you're right. And I think for the majority of my career, I thought that. But as I got into the executive level, this was a one where I learned it late. I had had a 360 review and the feedback that I got at the peer level to me was disappointing. It wasn't horrible, but it wasn't resoundingly favorable, you know? So I was talking with the coach and I said, well, you know, I don't understand. I've been working to prove myself and I've done this and I've done this. And they said, he said, you don't need to prove yourself. They know you can do the job. They've seen what you've done. You have a very high level of credibility. They don't know who you are. They don't know anything about you. They don't know <laughs> you as a person. They don't really engage with you very much. And, you know, it just sort of stunned me because I think when I'm at work, I'm really at work. So I'm not willing to go around chatting in people's offices and that kind of thing. I'll say good morning, but I don't usually go, how was your weekend or whatever? You know, one is I don't really care on the weekend. Well, I care about them as a person. So mm -hmm. if something was going on in their life, if their daughter graduated yeah. or if they're, you know, they had a baby or something like, I care about those things, but I don't care about their recreational activity on the weekend. So I really had to stop and go, oh, now I have to make small talk in order to, you know, be more familiar to people and let them know me. So I was very skeptical about this feedback when I first got it, but you know, I realized maybe in my mind, I was exaggerating it a little bit. So what, what I did, I didn't walk around and, and ask everyone how the weekend was, but when I would go into their office to talk to them about a particular business issue, I would start out with something else, or I would ask for their opinion on what the subject matter that I was talking about. And I would ask them questions about family or make a comment about what was going on in the news or something like that to just be a little bit more familiar. And it was amazing. This thing that I just thought was not, well, that can't possibly re be relevant. It made such a difference in how effective I was, how much they accepted me and accepted my ideas after I became a little less uptight about getting the job done and a little more familiar with them. I think it's an interesting point because it, it kind of relates to empathy, right? showing an interest at the same time, Marianne, in your company with more than 15,000 employees, if you ask everyone how their weekend went, uh, <laughs> that's true. <laughs> but I think what I find interesting is the lesson that you learned from that, your experience, your mental experience, say, wow, this makes sense. And yeah, I mean, not to just compare to what you're saying, but I have had similar experience that if you touch on that human element, the stories that come out sometimes are, are fascinating. And again, at the same time, you're obviously a very busy executive. So it's not to say I have hours of time to, to talk about these things, but it does make an impact on you. And of course, on the person that you're talking to. Well, and if you translate that into today, especially with people working so much remotely, we have to find ways to connect uh, at a different level in order to build trust and in order to have those effective working relationships. So it's even more important now to find a way to do that. Yeah. No, I like it. I like it. We have arrived at lesson number 10. Can you believe? <laughs> Stop to take a breath. Yeah. Gives you a little <laughs> extra. And it, it's a great timing for that lesson. Stop to take a breath. What are your thoughts? 
So this, this sort of falls in line with that responding versus react. So much of the time we're in a hurry and we're yeah. running on automatic pilot. We have all these things to do. We're trying to figure out how we can most efficiently get everything done. And we work quickly and sometimes force fit solutions. You know, it's sort of like yeah. you keep cranking on an igniter on a car that doesn't, you know, want to start. <laughs> and uh, you can be much more productive, or at least I can be, if I find time for some re reflection. Like if I walk away from it, if I'm cranking, 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 trying to get something done and I just go, okay, stop. It's not coming. The ideas aren't coming. You need to just take a break. And whether you go for a walk, just sleep on it overnight, the inspiration comes at a different time. So I think that stopping to take a breath and letting yourself have, you know, your mind just take over and the answer comes because, you know, we all have a wealth of experience. The answer is there somewhere, but it just needs to, you know, have the time to come out. Yeah. I, I have sometimes that when I write an email that I write it today, but I won't send it until tomorrow. And it's, it's not so much taking a breath because that that's more specific, you know, take a break, but to allow your mind to digest what you wrote before it goes out. And it, not every email I work that way, but, but in some cases it, it really, I find it helpful. And then the following day, I typically make a few adjustments and right. there it goes. Exactly. It's, it equates to taking that pause and, you know, um, another example of that, I think of my early days on the executive team at Avnet and it was daunting. I was the only female and. You know, I was bringing always all these ideas and yeah. wanting to make a lot of changes in HR and they weren't always readily received as I, as I would observe uh, from my standpoint. So I would get, I'd come out of a meeting, I'd go in with my agenda, I'd have everything prepared, I'd, I'd be ready to answer any single question and somehow the, the presentation went south, it went in a direction I never anticipated. And again, I was speaking with a coach about this saying, okay, this is, I, somehow I'm not being effective at doing this. And they said, well, what about reframing? You know, don't take this feedback you're getting as negative. Don't go in knowing that your presentation is going to get derailed. Invite people into the conversation. So rather than start with, here's the, you know, the three things I'm going to tell you, start with, here's the three things I'm looking for from you and invite the discussion in. So you're, you're inviting it in as opposed to being on the defensive when all this barrage of questions came. And so it was just a way of reframing a situation. Again, it made huge difference. And, and that probably would have been one. I wish I would have known that in my thirties as well. What I like in your 10 lessons is that it's, it's like a coaching session. You're coaching us. It's sharing your wisdom, but it's really helping us because these are all very, very good points. And I'm, I'm kind of curious because with all the lessons learned, is there perhaps a lesson that you have unlearned with your extensive experience? Well, the one that I have unlearned, but it's still a challenge. And so still <laughs> working to unlearn it completely is sort of overdoing things, doing too much. So whatever it is, whether it's prepping for the podcast or what, or prepping for a work presentation or prepping dinner for my family, whatever it may be, I always take it to the nth degree. You know, I'm, I can have a little bit of those perfectionist te tendencies. And sometimes I, I catch myself now and go, okay, it's enough. You got this. It's really good. What you've got is good. You don't have to keep doing more and doing more. It's more about, you know, more about balance, more about ensuring that every aspect of your life, whether it's from a business standpoint, personal, um, spiritual, whatever, that you've got a good balance of everything and you're not overdoing any particular aspect. Yeah. Very, very powerful. Uh, good, good to hear. And perhaps again, something to weave into your system, right? Yes, absolutely. The system, everybody, you need a system. Well, Marianne, thank you so much for sharing your wisdoms with us and, and with our audience worldwide. Very helpful. So I want to definitely thank you for that. And I want to make a few closing remarks. 
You have been listening to the international podcast, 10 Lessons It Took Me 50 Years to Learn, sponsored by PDF, the Professional Development Forum. PDF provides webinars, social media discussions, podcasts, and parties. And best of all, it's all for free. For more information, please visit professionaldevelopmentforum.org. Our guest today was Marianne Miller uh, from Phoenix, Arizona, a global human resources expert and a board advisor sharing her 10 lessons it took her 50 years to learn. And to our audience, don't forget to leave us a review or a comment. You can also email us at podcast at 10 lessonslearnedcom That is podcast at number 1010lessonslearned.com. Go ahead and subscribe so that you don't miss any future episodes. And remember, this is a podcast that makes the world wiser and wiser, podcast by podcast, lesson by lesson. Thank you and stay safe.